everybody, and welcome to a tubular wild ride with Steve-O. You don't get greater of the greats than Kelly Slater. I mean, come on. When the guy got in the van, I was genuinely starstruck. Like, ooh. you know, I had to like kind of keep myself under wraps, which I managed to do until the end. And then I broke down and told him how awesome he was and... I mean, dude, he's just so awesome. Um, we talked about shark attacks. Ooh, Vinny's like, how many of your buddies died while surfing? Like, that was gnarly. Dude, but what a great guy and what an epic clothing company he owns. I mean, does he own it? Yeah, right? Outer known? Dude, killer clothes. Uh, I'm just wildly impressed by him as a person, as an athlete, everything all across the boards. This guy's epic. He's the greatest of all time. So let's get into it. Got you some hot sauce too. Sweet. Yeah, I got some. For my some butthole. Water. I appreciate that. <laughs> 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 nice. Yeah. All right. That's what it says, right? Yeah. yeah. There you go. Big time. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Kelly Slater. Yeah. Yeah, dude. How's it going, man? Dude, so good, man. All right. Um, it's uh, it, it's so exciting, man. I, like we always wanted to have you, dude. I always wanted to to get you on here. All right. And uh, th this is cool. Um, is it true that at the moment you're recovering from hip surgery? Yep, I'm just uh, exactly three weeks out from hip surgery. Just had it. Um, left hip, old injury. Did a whole bunch of stuff in there. Just had to cut out scar tissue and inflammation. Had. Uh, um, li there's a little bit of arthritis, not terrible yet. I still got a little cartilage that's kind of helping me, but I had some broken bone in there the doctor had to take out. I don't know when or how I broke that, but um, I had to get a new labrum put in. Uh, so they took my old labrum completely out, put a cadaver labrum in, and uh, shaved down some bone. And he said there were some other foreign bodies in there. Wow. So I don't know what those were. Little cartilage foreign pieces bodies. or something. I don't know, little pieces that sit around and accumulate waste but and that was from a distinct injury to your hip I did a really distinct injury on a wipeout when I was like 19 injured a few more times basically doing the splits uh -huh. and uh, just tearing something in there and I thought I broke my femur the first time I did it but <clears throat> it was just a torn something at 19 you don't look forward to being injured and being out of the water so I was like oh I'll, I'll be okay you know and yeah. then 10 years later I after I'd done it three or four more times, something similar, that I, I went in for surgery, cleaned it up, just an arthroscopic, and then um, this time it was uh, it was just annoying. Like, my back was hurting because of it. My hip was in pain a lot. I wasn't surfing much. I hardly ever practiced in. Or I was totally unprepared for the last year and a half on tour because I just don't surf very much because my hip hurts, and I end up uh, wasting... Usually I end up wasting the, uh, the the good feeling of the hip either on really good waves or on golf days. Wow. Yes. <laughs> it's crazy. I'm, I'm just particularly interested in that because just out of nowhere, <clears throat> for no reason that I can understand, my right hip is just... Like, yeah, there's no telling what you've done in those, all those years, dude. <laughs> right. It, yeah, for, for, for no reason. For, so for no reason. <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> is it the uh, the jumping off into the jacuzzi? Is it the... Uh, I mean, I got bit by a croc there once, but, <laughs> you know, like... But it couldn't be that. It was too long ago. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, like, I'm, I'm not... I feel like it's just uh, old age setting in. But, um, you know, our Jackass director, Jeff Tremaine, he had a, a, a hip replacement... I mean, he doesn't do anything. <laughs> Dude, it's going fast now. Everyone's getting a hip replacement. And everyone I know gets it. It's like, I was up and walking that day, and I was feeling fine. Like, it's, yeah. it's, it's a much easier recovery than what I'm doing. I actually Thanks started doing yoga recently. Like, I got into, like, a, a morning regimen doing yoga every morning, and my hip... Like, like, just started bothering me. Like after that, it's so gotten you, worse. Yoga has screwed me up. <laughs> do you do you finally took enough time out to realize, holy shit, I'm in pain. <laughs> right. what you did. Yeah, um, I, I used to do yoga a lot. I used to do the Bikrams, the hot yoga. Uh huh. Um, then you watched that documentary. Then uh, you know, and then he tried to <laughs> touch me. <laughs> no, I watched that documentary. I'm like, whoa! It, it, right. do I, should I feel bad doing this yoga? But, right. Um, no, I, but uh, I had a friend in Florida, this girl who was who was uh, trained up in it, and I used to do her class a couple times a week when I was home in Florida, and 
I loved it. I got my mom into it and it was helping her out. And um, I love how I feel when I get into the yoga, but I just, I travel so much now. I, I just don't get into my pattern in each place for quite a long enough time to, you know, there's a jujitsu class, there's a yoga class, there's a massage person. I'm yeah. trying to do all that and surf. And, and uh, so. What, what's the, is, is it the travel for surfing? Yeah, travel's all surfing right. stuff. But, I mean, I might be in, you know, Fiji for two or three days and then be in Bali for a week and then back to Australia. It's just, you chase right. swell. When you start chasing swells, like when you get into that thing, it's uh, it's tough to get your whole recovery plan going because it's like up to the minute. Let's go to there. Let's go to this place. But if I'm at a contest and I'm set, I generally have been there and I know enough people and the right things to kind of do my my physio and rehab while I'm there. What, what's <clears throat> what's the, the timetable for chasing a swell? Is it like... I guess it depends on the swell. It depends storm. on the storm and, and uh, you know, winter swells and summer swells are different. Summer, a lot of time you're chasing hurricanes. Like if you go to Japan right now, you'd be ta- chasing uh, typhoon swells, which you just kind of got to be ahead of it or where the swell's going, but the wind's good. And wow. try not to get smashed by the storm. But this, uh, the Atlantic, um, the East Coast hurricane season, the Caribbean's been awesome. Like there's been like four or five storms in a row that start well east of Barbados. The Caribbean, yeah, east of Barbados, and then they skirt the islands, don't hit anybody or, you know, cause any damage, and then then go up towards Nova Scotia and back in the Atlantic and kind of double back. So the only place getting affected by those really by the storm has been Bermuda so far. But it's been, right now, it's been kind of a dream season for a surfer on the East Coast because there's yeah. a lot of waves and the storms aren't hitting, so. Yeah. <clears throat> but, yeah, I mean, to, to chase those things, it, it depends what you want to chase. Like, Back in the late 90s, uh, a couple friends of mine chased a storm starting in maybe New Zealand or Tahiti, and they went all the way to Alaska um, almost every day somewhere else. Like, so get to South America, Central America, California, Northern California, fly up to, you know, maybe Canada and then, then to Alaska. So Tofino, that could be like huh? a, t- that could be like a two week, um, timetable you know from when the swell starts to when it gets all the way up there and it's all run out do you have your own pilot when you do that <laughs> oh, you wish <laughs> I, I saw something with you one time where, where nobody's you, got enough money from surfing to have a pilot at this point but i feel like there was a video of you with a pilot like research <laughs> researching a storm and like you were looking at places to go yeah i i actually do have a friend who uh, works for an airline not an airline a, a plane company and he delivers planes and um he just happens to be in some of the places I'm at sometimes and flies me around. But we haven't really done a, a swell chase. We just kind of fly around. Maybe we made it look like we were chasing a swell. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I, we have a couple times. I got a, a friend of mine back in Florida has a, a little six-seater, and we go down the Bahamas and chase swells there. And when you do that, are you, are you finding places where, like, nobody's ever <clears throat> been? Yeah. Yeah, you generally find a reef or something that no one's ever surfed. And you get to name it? You get to name it, yeah. If you catch the first wave, you do. Yeah, yeah. That's the that's the. Or if you blow it, maybe your friend gets to name it after <laughs> you. you know? It is yeah. incredible how hard it is to find an empty surf spot. Nowadays, yeah, it's pretty tough. You got to go further and further. We we took four different airplanes Five. To, to get to Madagascar. Oh yeah, and Madagascar. then and then we're on a boat going out to breaks just in the middle of the ocean, and there was no such thing as an empty wave. Yeah, Madagascar has gotten kind of popular the last few years, but it, it's always had great surf, but just didn't have much of a population. But and then we, we went all the way to the Philippines, and we found out that Cloud Nine was called Crowd Nine. It's Crowd Nine, yeah. <laughs> that thing got crowded out real quick. But yeah. the, the Philippines has like 1,200 islands or something. Yeah. There's there's yeah. a lot of potential for. I've seen footage of really good empty waves there in recent years. So, yeah. but the same thing, you got to kind of be on it because those those uh, this time of year the typhoons come by those hurricanes yeah and um they might last a day it might be five days but you got to be moving and being in the right spot for the right direction of swell and the wind so have you messed around with the how do you pronounce it nazare nazare yeah in i've Portugal? been there a few times yeah i haven't surfed it on a giant day i surfed it on a day that was probably half as big as it gets you know uh-huh. so maybe like 25 30 foot faces kind of thing but n- not like a massive life or death day yeah. I've been there on a couple of those days, but it was windy and no one was surfing. And that was maybe a decade ago. I, I went and first looked at it. And at that point, only Garrett McNamara was just kind of starting to check it out in 09, 2010, around that time. And trying to get crews together to, to be able to run safety and 
you know, guys who wanted waves like that. Yeah, I mean, what, the, he just set the new world record, right, for the biggest wave, or somebody did recently. Um, yeah, Sebastian Stutner, this German guy who, yeah. who who's like, who's like really into towing. It's not a hundred feet, but it's. I mean, people see it, and the, the the problem with like Joe Rogan even reposted it, and there were people on there were debating the size of the wave, and I said, well, it's probably in the you know eighty eighty five foot region, and all these people were like, bullshit, man. Like, I've gone well. When you're 200 feet up, taking a picture of the face of a wave, you see the whole curve of the wave. So it's going to look 200 feet long or high. Yeah. But, you know, the, the curve isn't added in to the height. So when you get back at sea level and you see, okay, that wave is probably 8 or 10 times overhead. So it's, you know, 60 to 80 feet or something. So, so what's I don't think anyone's ridden 100 foot it, wave. It was, it was in 2018. Point. There was like a new record. Somebody posts this this photo, or this video of like the biggest wave ever. I'm like, oh man, this is great, amazing. And I repost it, but the person who I was reposting had named the wrong person. So then I get this. Uh, like you know, it was like seven million views, and I was and I had credited the wrong person, and then the next day, like <laughs> the guy who it was, like texted mm-hmm. like, bro, I got a thousand followers. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You didn't like, help me at all. <laughs> the the the, ne- the next day, uh, like it was on, like on you know, Steve-O posts big wave, gets seven million views, credits wrong surfer. I'm like, no, and uh, <laughs> the um, it was Sebastian who actually it was. Who was surfing the wave? Yeah, yeah. Sebastian Studner. He wasn't even tripping, but but when I when I corrected it, like the guy who I had falsely credited was like, "Dude, why'd you change it?" <laughs> really? <laughs> he was the only one who got yeah, butter. He was so bummed. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, send me a clip, bro. Yeah. You see how big it was. I mean, he was like, "Oh, yeah. dude, after you did that and took it away, man, let, let me give you a clip and you can then post me." Yeah. And I was like, no, dude. but funny, if, if funny. Um, like there, there's so many guys now that charge big waves. When, when I was a kid, it was really like you could count on two hands who was going to go on the biggest right. days, you know. And and uh, and there wasn't all the water safety. There wasn't jet skis. You know, occasionally a helicopter might fly and drop a line to you and hope you can grab onto it. But there was we didn't have all the watercraft watercraft guys doing safety and the lifeguards out there protecting. You know, kind of keeping an eye out for you and the inflation vests and. The, the big wave training that guys are doing, the courses we run through in pools and stuff. So, you know, you're simulating radical situations, you know, dangerous, scary situations, putting your mind in that place and trying to calm yourself down because you know it's controlled. But when you get you get yourself in a situation in the ocean, you got to be prepared for it. Like, you can't always rely on that inflation vest or another person to pick you up. Like, you got to be prepared for the worst. And so it's a, it's it's pretty full on how many guys now are dedicating their lives to just surfing the biggest waves they can and and uh i'm surprised more people haven't drowned to be honest yeah that was going to be my question how many people can you recall that have died chasing the biggest waves um patrick swayze and yeah patrick swayze (laughs) definitely um (laughs) i'm surprised keanu reeves didn't go down yeah um (laughs) no well we've had a, a number of friends drown yeah um todd chesser in 97 mark fu in 94 he was at Mavericks. Todd was in Hawaii. Um, my friend Donnie in 95, he drowned at Waimea. Cy Miloski at Mavericks. So there's been, there's been quite a few. Yeah. Um, um, Greg Long drowned at Cortez Bank, like 100, 120 miles off the coast here, but he was revived and saved. And then he was in Fiji with another friend of ours, Aaron Gold, and Aaron drowned, and, um, and Greg resuscitated him. Wow. So, so, you know, we've had some close calls. There's mm-hmm. been a few guys at Mavericks that have been real close. Maya Gabera, the female surfer, has come close twice, once in Tahiti, once at Nazare. A guy did die at Nazare last year. I, I, it's unclear to me if he drowned or if he had a heart attack. I, th- I heard both, and um, I didn't know him personally, but he was a Brazilian guy or Portuguese guy. I feel like like when you're surfing out there and you have the oh shit moments, like when you're like, oh fuck, there's like five waves behind it, you always think back to like, what you wish you would have done different like and for me when i'm in that situation i'm like i wish my cardio was better those are moments i know all too well and 
gosh, is it a good idea to avoid them, especially when it comes to your privacy online. And that's why I have to tell you about NordVPN. This is the way to protect your passwords, to keep people from snooping around in your bank accounts, all of these different kinds of things that are so important to protect. And this service pays for itself because you can change your location, making it so that you buy airplane tickets from another country, which will give you much more favorable rates. And you can watch all kinds of programs that aren't available in your country because you're logging in through another country. Let's try to count the ways that NordVPN rules. You just can't. And if you want to get a huge discount, then you go to nordvpn.com slash stevo. Plus, with my discount, you're also going to get four months completely free, four additional months completely for free on your two-year plan. You just can't beat it, especially because you got the 30-day risk-free money-back guarantee. So with absolutely nothing to lose and everything to gain, I tell you to go to nordvpn.com slash Stevo for that huge discount plus the four additional free months. Protect yourself at all times. Now, let's get back to it. You know, is there any way to, tr like, mm. when you're doing big wave surfing, is it... I wish I didn't fall in that last wave. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but when you do, you're like, it, are you guys doing, like, breath-holding exercises? Yeah. Is that the main one, or is it just all different? Um, I mean, a lot of guys are doing all sorts of cross-training. Cross-fit came real big in the surf world for a while. They're going um, to Laird's house. Going to Laird's house. And they're, like, <laughs> doing weights underwater. And training with cool. Laird and Gabby. Training with uh, Mark Visser in Australia. There's, there's a number of different people that are running these different courses. There's a big wave, uh, there's a group um, specifically doing big wave training, so teaching everyone how to do safety pickups, but also um, getting comfortable in bad situations, doing CPR, you know, so everyone who's on, yeah. who's on location can potentially help out. Is Chuck Patterson still surfing big waves? Chuck charges. I yeah. did the EMT class with him. Yeah, like I don't 08. know Chuck real well, but I know he charges. He's I, I've seen him ride some big waves. Yeah, because there's a bunch of young kids in the class, and and I was one of them. And I'm like, who's this guy in the? They're like that's Chuck Patterson, and we we all went on YouTube and we're like, yeah. that's this yeah. fucking guy. Chuck's that's sort in of the like class? not scared of anything. It no. seems like yeah. yeah. I mean, he's like just dropping into like forty foot barrels. And yeah, yeah. He, he, yeah. He also was like the first guy to put on. Um, um, snow skis and, or uh, sorry, water skis and go ride like a really big wave. <laughs> Just to yeah. see. Oh, no, right. Yeah, our, our buddy Poopies did that. Yeah. You know Poopies? I know Poopies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I saw an article today that uh, the Fonz came out and he said it was like 50 years ago today when he jet skied or he uh, water skied over sharks. I was uh, going to send that to Poopies. Oh, when he I jumped. Thought. I remember I remember watching that show and right, he's about to jump. They're like, Next week, <laughs> yeah. Like, God, I gotta, I gotta wait. I was so excited. Like, what's gonna happen next week? Yeah, that was like 50 yeah. years ago that, today, or whatever it was. That was the whole saying, "Jump the shark." And then Poopies was dressed up as the Fonz when he got bit by the shark. Was he really? Yeah, was, was he? Like, I didn't even were notice that. the jump the shark thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were like, oh well, we're out of ideas, so like we've really decided to jump the shark. And Where were so, you guys at? Uh, where was that? They, they, they didn't want us to say, but we were in Bahamas. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. What's Why the, didn't what kind of shark bit him? Um, is a bull shark or just a reef Caribbean shark? Caribbean reef shark. Reef shark, yeah. And I mean, dude, like when we got to that location, like... Sharks like, everywhere? Like, uh, throw like a, you know, a, a piece of fish into the water and it was just you know like some mm. overblown piranha movie it looked like they were just going crazy for it like we should have yeah. known better man yeah i mean yeah you can swim with sharks all you want but when you start feeding them shit gets real real quick yeah, it's, it's, i mean they don't know they're just like they smell and, sn and they're just freaking out like if you spear a fish and a shark is anywhere close he's on you right away and they're so agitated looking they want your fish you know but as soon as you get that fish out of the water they chill they just yeah. like they they definitely move like you know a few yards further away and they're not as fast and like but as soon as there's some blood in the water you I don't want to be in the water with them i remember it, like at, at that location like 
a leaf landed on the water. Like, I don't even know where a leaf <laughs> came from, but they're like, a leaf landed on the water. <laughs> really? <laughs> a little yeah, water and a leaf like, falling. Yeah. Dude, it was insane. Um, Are there any places that you surf where you're like scared to go in of sharks? You know, like the, the yeah, sharks you know, are more south, common like now. J Bay or yeah, like J Bay is always a concern. Anywhere, Namibia. In, everywhere in South Africa is a concern. I'm not worried about Namibia. No one, I've never heard of an attack in Namibia. So, just uh, if you're oblivious to it, you don't yeah. worry about it so much. And there's so many seals there that I think they'd have a hard time finding a surfer in between the seals. Like, yeah, there's thousands of seals at that Skeleton Bay wave, like all over the beach. It's Skeleton Bay. <laughs> not on the, the on, not at the point break so much. Like a few of them will kind of run up the beach there, but if you go down the on the beach past the point, there's literally five or ten thousand seals there, sea lions. Yeah, where were we in, in in South Africa, Jeffrey's Bay, when we all got in the water, <laughs> and then everybody took a wave in, and I'm sitting out there by myself, and I was the only person out there. I was yeah. like, "Are you fucking kidding me?" Yeah, I've been to the same like, spot, yeah. the same spot where we're, Mick Fanning like uh, yeah. beat off the shark in the competition. He beat off the shark. <laughs> that's, a, that's a weird way to say it. Yeah. Um, no, I was I had I surfed against Mick in the semifinals, and that happened in the finals. So we surfed for half an hour, and he won the heat, and uh, and then. We had a half an hour break before their final, him and Julian Wilson, and so I surfed that next half hour. So I was out there for about an hour, and right as I caught a wave and hit the beach, the, the shark thing happened with Mick, and I had been sitting right there for like an hour. So my, wow. you know, I don't know if that's good or bad or what, but you know, him beating me in that semifinal was maybe a good thing for me, <laughs> and he didn't get touched, so maybe it worked out just right. I mean, that was the coolest thing. I mean. That like he, he didn't get hurt. It was just like the most yeah. macho moment of all time. He was, man. That I was with him that night, and he was so in shock and like so freaked out of what happened. Right. It was it, it was a strange thing because um, we have jet skis and water assist when we're surfing contests, but they'll never come into the lineup unless somebody's really injured or there's a shark attack or whatever. Right. And yeah, there it is. And and um. And I saw that I, I couldn't hear the spe guy on the speaker talking. I couldn't hear what was going on, but I saw the two jet skis in a boat zoom right in the lineup. And I went, there's only one reason that would possibly happen. There's no, there's been no sets. There's been no action. No one got hurt surfing. And I just went, we're at Jeffrey's Bay. There's no other reason they come in with the skis like that. And, uh, I mean, all of our theory is that this shark was swimming by and, um, and didn't know what he was, you know, and, and went, oh, what's this thing? And, went to investigate and you can see Mick's facing away so the shark's behind the board and everyone thinks that basically the shark got the leash caught in its mouth and when it yeah. did it felt like it was getting caught or something right like hooked and it started freaking out so it didn't this doesn't look like a classic um attack you know a shark would come right. up and bang you hit you from below and um you know so then he was you can see the the picture there in the bottom left corner of those four yeah that one you can see the shark right there the shark's about to slap mick in the face with its tail and that's what knocked mick off his board and then because the leash broke i think that we think the part that was in the shark's mouth uh the, the, when the sorry the the part still attached to the board was in the shark's mouth and the shark's went away and mick went behind this wave if you watch the video the, the the camera was zoomed in on it was like a you know these are live events we do on our webcast yeah the coverage was pretty pretty mm -hmm. up close yeah my friend was the a friend of mine was directing at the time and he goes Kelly it's so crazy he goes right right before it happened I said um, camera one on Mick zoom in and they went in on Mick and he's just sitting there and the shark thing happened boom it was the, that was the camera like live that was <laughs> being be, yeah being, I remember seeing it live shown, you know and then he Mick fought with the thing for a, a few seconds and then went over the swell and he disappeared from the camera angle and uh and for about five ten seconds no one had any idea if it just ate him right and it was like i i wasn't watching but when you watch the video and even now you know something didn't happen to him and you watch this video like i watch it and i'm like holding my breath like holy right. shit what's going on right there and then you when you look the board's about 20 yards away and he's swimming towards the beach and then the ski comes in he swims back and he he's going backwards he didn't know he's shark. trying to find the shark you know because like if you ever have a situation in the ocean with a shark face the shark i don't care what your instincts tell you face the shark you have to because it's predator prey and you know you yeah. see if a lion gets spotted it changes the game it's like the, it, there's no different with sharks if you face a shark they realize oh i've been kind of seen and 
you've, I've seen some of these, uh, some of the people who swim with the sharks in Hawaii, the tigers, they do these experiments to film and show where the, maybe the shark's 20, 30 yards away. They swim away splashing. Shark comes up at them quick. Yeah. As soon as they turn around and face the shark, it, it goes to about half the speed and calms down. And it's like, oh, because they're investigating right. things that are splashing in the ocean look like they're dying. And they're the cleaners of the ocean. So they're just after anything that's erratic. So you got to like somehow pull it together and be calm and see a shark and face it. Yeah, I don't know how true this is. My buddy was studying sharks in South Africa, and he's like, yeah, we would swim in the water with sharks when it's sunny out. They can do it. They're just kind of chilling there. And he's like, if there's a cloud cover, if it gets dark, he's like, they all just go straight down to the bottom because that's when they get in hunt mode. He's like, if that yeah. happens, And they, they, run. they hunt from below. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, so they're just instinctive. If they're letting you see them, you know, m most of the people I know that know sharks really well, if they're letting you see them, they're pretty mellow. Yeah. Like, um my daughter and my girlfriend and I were on my jet ski and <coughs> we were on a jet ski in uh, Fiji and the water was really calm between the island and this, the break where we were surfing and I just stopped and I looked down and I'm like, oh, there's a shark down there. So it's about 30 feet deep or so and I jump off with a mask and I swim down and there's three sharks and, um, and I told them, I go, you guys jump in and right when they jumped in, I go, look, there's three sharks right there. My daughter literally almost flew out of the water. Like, whoo, she was back on the ski in like a half a second. For sure. And I'm like, no, no, they, like, I see them, they see us. Like, they're, they're, they're totally mellow. You can see when a shark's agitated or hungry. It's a whole different yeah. animal, you know? Yeah, there's those sharks over here. Or if they're mad at poopies, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, if they're poopies. <laughs> yeah, that, that guy that had all the, uh, at, at the trails, maybe like 10 years ago, where they had the two juvenile sharks following him on the uh, mm -hmm. stand-up paddle, probably, and yeah. he had the GoPro attached to it, and they were just following him along. And yeah, I mean, they, every single day, there's a guy I follow on Instagram who films him at Del Mar and people are just oblivious. They're just swimming and bodyboarding and surfing and great white swimming all amongst them. And yeah, no one, no one seems to spot the sharks very often, but right. now they're yeah, catching on the fact like when that, when that drone is about six feet off the water, somewhere between you and that drone, there's a shark usually. You like people. Ah, oh, so yeah. when you yeah. see the drone, like you watch yeah. the drone, you can spot where the sharks are swimming. Sketchy. But, but every time, Every time a surfer even accidentally turns and paddles or a swimmer swims towards the sharks that they're not seeing, the shark devi deviates off its, its line. So it'll come up to investigate, usually from behind, and then as soon as someone turns and faces it, they, they just kind of like, oh, I'm not looking at you. They, yeah. It's, it's an instinctual thing, you know? Yeah, they said that to have a, 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 like a shark population, for every like one great white shark, you have to have like a, a hundred sea lions around within a five mile radius for their food supply. Hmm. And at Crystal Cove, there's a population of like 300 seals over there. So statistically, there's like within five miles of that area, there's three there's great, white many great whites. <laughs> yeah, there's way too many great whites. Yeah, it's... Luckily, f I guess, fortunately for us at this point, all those ones in Del Mar are juveniles. Not all of them, but most of them are under 10 feet, you know, maybe under, probably under eight feet. Once I get to about nine, 10 feet is when they say they start seeing them prey on, uh, on mammals, you know, bigger than stingrays and fish. But wow. wouldn't juveniles be more scary because they're kind of like testing everything out and they're, or Not they as much. I mean, a great, a, a big great white, a, an adult great white already kind of knows its place and knows it's kind of running the scene, I think, you know? Yeah. It's like a lion with its pride. They kind of know who's around and size each other up and stuff. Yeah. Man. I don't know. I, you, I mean, I haven't swum with them, so I, I, I can't say all the interactions, but this is from what friends of mine who swim and do fin <coughs> rides on them and stuff tell me. Fuck that. Yeah, yeah. seriously. I want to do it, though, that. but fuck that. I know. Dude, Zach right. Efron's doing it on a tiger shark. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. He, Zach Efron got together with Ocean Ramsey and and like gotcha. literally rode a tiger, a tiger shark, yeah. like, like holding the fin. Yeah. Did that, you ever see any great whites when you were uh, on the on the the shores of Baywatch? <laughs> well, I <laughs> I was gonna kill one um, by with bare hands on the show, but uh -huh. they just couldn't. We couldn't find the right shark. <laughs> yeah. I uh, th we had some ridiculous um, storylines though, and. Uh, one of my favorites was that we had been surfing this place, myself and Dave Charvet. Our characters were surfing this this place, and it was supposed to be like maybe near Santa Cruz or somewhere. And we neither of us were wearing leashes for the obvious reason that we need our boards to wash into the the uh, the big cave that's on the beach. Of course, you wouldn't wear a leash, so you want to test your board getting washed in this cave. So we both lose our boards. And we end up uh, fighting 
we, we, we end up going in there to try to retrieve boards and we realize there's like 30 boards in there and they're being protected by an octopus that's stealing, essentially stealing their <laughs> wow. boards. Yeah. Jesus. So we, so we had to fight the shark. I think Dave ended up killing the shark. Dude, that's yeah, epic. It was, it was awesome. We, uh, is it like, do people bring up the, you were on Baywatch all the time? Do you hear that a lot? Pretty often. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, then we, we saw something where, where you said that you were like kind of bummed about it, like when you were on the oh, show. Oh, I was just so embarrassed being on that. I'm um, being on a TV show. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to be on the show, and um, my then manager really wanted me to be like a, a movie or TV star. He sure. wanted me to be an actor, and so he said, I, I set this, um, I set this uh, meeting up for you to go and just talk about the show. And I didn't know what Baywatch was. It, it was on season one at the time. Right. So it wasn't like a big thing yet. And um, he said, you know, you, you, did you just read some lines and check it. And kind of, I went, yeah, I don't want to do this. And he goes, well, I already made the meeting. So like, you know, just go, just go check it out. Kind of talked me into it. And I did it. And I swear, I forgot every line. My, my, my acting was, was intentionally not good. Like, uh, I was like, yeah, I don't want to be on a TV show. No. And, and uh, I wasn't even getting into any kind of a character or anything. I was just kind of reading lines and fumbling them. And then they like, like a day or two later, they're like, oh, we really love him. And I'm like, man, how bad's this show? <laughs> like, I was, I was terrible, you know? I know I wasn't good. Like, in school, I, when I was a little kid, I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be in plays yeah. and stuff because my parents both, um, my dad and my mom both acted in plays. We had this thing called the Follies in Cocoa Beach in the 70s, and they both acted on stage and did various different plays and stuff. And I kind of looked up, like, that was kind of my dream when I was like five or something. Yeah. And, I love Steve Martin. I wanted to be like a comedic actor when I got older, and uh, we, you know, we spent endless hours watching The Jerk and you know dumb movies like that. But it, that was my childhood. And then when it came time to actually be on a show, I didn't want to be. And then I got the part. And then um, I, yeah, it was just a, a little bit of a whirlwind because. I was having to try and film, and they were trying to schedule between my surfing contest. And the first year I was on Baywatch was the first year I won the world title. So it was I was trying to fit both those things in. But um, ultimately, I had so many guys make fun of me for being on Baywatch that it was like fuel to the fire. I'm like, oh, I'm going to kick this guy's ass. Wow. Like, I would just read a comment here and there. But you didn't have social media, you know? You had to maybe find it in a magazine right, or, like, right, uh, right. you know, he said it on a video or something. But... Um, but I was probably like so sensitive to it that I was just imagining some of that anyways. Right. But I just, as I got into my, like after being 10 years old, 12 years old, and I started winning contests and doing well, my whole dream in my life was to try and be a world champion and surf contests. And that was my goal. And um, that manager of mine used to say, you know, someday people are going to remember you to surf. And I'm like, that's so insulting because that's all I want to do in my life. I, want, I don't want to be known for Baywatch. I want to be known because I did well surfing. And Now, let me ask you, what do you want to be known for? Being a schmuck who wears crappy clothes that exploit people and destroy the environment? Or for being an awesome dude who wears sustainable clothing made from organic materials produced by fair trade factories and that actually treat people who make the clothes nicely? Because that is what this legend Kelly Slater's company, Outer Known, is all about. And I'm telling you, I'm wearing... The the clothes right now they are fantastic plus if you want to get a huge discount i'm talking 25 percent then you can go to outerknown.com slash stevo and use the promo code stevo at checkout that's outerknown.com slash stevo o-u-t-e-r-k-n-o-w-n dot com slash stevo and use the promo code stevo again for a full 25 percent off your order support kelly slater and save the world now let's get back to it and um but you know at this point i look back and i'm like that's pretty cool i was on that show because what a weird thing in life, you know? Like, right. if nothing else, it's it was just so... That's a big, still the so, biggest show there ever was. Yeah, right? maybe. Do you I still mean, get paid from it? Residual uh, checks? Well, that was the other thing. I didn't hardly make any money on that show. I, I would make 2500 bucks a show before taxes. So it was not a lot. 
Huh. You know, yeah. it was just it was just emerging, and I did get residuals for years, and sometimes I would literally get checks for like six dollars and thirteen cents, and yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm killing it. I remember, uh, <laughs> but I remember filming with David Hasselhoff for Wild Boys, and uh, the Hoff. Yeah, dude, and and we were like, like you know, Jeff Tremaine is pretty particular about stuff. You know, he's like, oh, you're, and 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 ha- David Hasselhoff, like we're trying to shoot one thing, and he's like, dude. We could have shot three episodes of Baywatch by now, dude. Come on, man. Look what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then like and we shot with them a couple times too. And and I remember I like, think they would shoot a, a whole episode about every five days. Right. You know? Yeah. So. Um, what what country were you with the hot? Uh, it was for the California episode, and um, they were sitting, like said he like I remember him like catching himself in a mirror and be like, God, man. I, I, I look like shit, dude. I'm old, but at least I'm rich. <laughs> like, That's great. It's the raddest thing to say. Oh, I, I always like. Uh, hey, Hasselhoff was always super cool to me. Oh, dude, the I best. really enjoyed. Uh, I really enjoyed being around him. Every once in a while, every few years, I'll get a phone call from him, and he'll tell me what he's been doing for 30 minutes, and then say bye, and I won't talk to him for a few years. You know, dude, but he was I always super, it. super dude, cool to coolest me. Coolest dude ever. Yeah. They 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 talked him into. Uh, putting like the black mama sock on because i was asleep on the boat we were going out to film with blue sharks and they got him to put the the black mama sock on and slap me awake and uh like he did that and like part of the course like i just woke up in a rage attacking david Hasselhoff. <laughs> pretty epic well you that was when you jumped out and you were pissed off no no, no but dude I, it's, I got pissed off every time they did that to me like uh <laughs> but yeah dude these are the best um, but so the uh, the Baywatch thing was the, went on for a while. Didn't like I did it two. I did seven shows over two seasons. So I did like five in ninety two and two in ninety set ninety three. Oh, okay. And then um, after the uh, after the Bay after the octopus nice. episode, I just uh, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> I'm <laughs> done. Uh, you guys got to write me off of this thing. <laughs> and then the director decided to talk me out of it. Producers and I'm like, hey, I just my heart's not in it, and I don't want to disrespect you guys, but. Like, I just, I want to go surf. I want to dedicate all of my energy to what I love doing the most. And I just don't have it in me to be on the show. And they're like, really? Yeah. You don't want to be on the show? Like, this is the number one show in the world at this point. And I'm like, right. eh. Dude, that's just, epic. It doesn't we- matter. It's like, if, 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 sure, if that's if I wanted to be an actor, then I would be frothing at the, yeah. at, at the, the opportunity, you know. But it just wasn't, wasn't what I wanted to do. We're at... Uh, we're- were you in the movie North Shore? You were, yeah. I was not. No, oh, you weren't. No, That's but uh, a lot, a bunch of my friends were. But I was like fourteen or fifteen when that was right, filmed, right. maybe sixteen. But uh, I love that. Sh- I love that movie. I wish, I wish it had been like a straight comedy. Yeah, <laughs> it would have been just like it I mean, might have been the is. best comedy <laughs> ever. Kind of there's is. a there's a there's an amazing um, comedic funny scripted surf movie called uh, Brice Denise. Okay. It's a French surf movie and you, you have to watch it. This All guy right. lives in the med and he wants to be a surfer and it starts, like the opening scene is him sitting on his board like up close waiting for a wave and it pans back and there's like old women in like uh, um, the salon thing. Yeah, like they got the thing over their head, you know, yeah, yeah. or whatever just like doing the backstroke next to him in the med and there's not, a, <laughs> there's not even a ripple and he's just like sitting there dreaming but, um, and he's kind of wealthy and then he, he, he finds out that on the other side of France, in, in the Atlantic side, there's good waves. So he goes there, but he gets, like, localized. It's just, but he has a bunch of money, so he's trying to, like, bring all, everyone in to come and party at his house. But he's also, like, super spiritual. It's really kind of a weird, twisted movie. But I thought it was maybe the best surf movie I ever saw. And uh, it's in French? Uh, yeah, I think it was in subtitles. Okay. Yeah. Um, did, uh, did you do any other acting other than Baywatch? Um, nothing notable. Yeah. Endless Summer too. Yeah, I mean that's not really acting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really did pick that snake up and throw it at my friend. <laughs> so, um, with uh, all the all the surfing, um, how much? I know that like, you're you're super passionate about the the, the environment and the all the your outer known company is mm-hmm. big into like just in, donating to help the environment. Like, how does that work? Yeah, well. I left Quicksilver after 23 years and uh, started my own brand, Outer Known. And I wanted to do recycled, regenerated, or organic fabrics. And 
wanted to, to um, be socially compliant. In other words, go and handpick the, the production facilities we use, uh, make sure that everyone's got a good living wage and working environment and that kind of stuff. And, mm-hmm. you know, you, you can do good business in some of these places that have a bad name. Like for China, in China, for instance, you can find a good factory that treats its workers right, but you can also go find a place that is like straight up slave labor. So you got you need to <clears throat> pick and choose, and you, you got to you have to get big enough, uh, or sort of partner with other people who are using the same textiles to bring the prices down to a place that are reasonable for people to buy. So we are we wouldn't be in that fast fashion category price price wise. When we launched, actually, it was really tough because we launched in a because we're doing like fifty of that and three hundred of this and like not very yeah. big volumes, you know. Whereas like when I was with Quicksilver, they might do ten or twenty thousand pairs of this this particular right. trunk in this color, and you know we might make a hundred or two hundred of something. And so factories just don't want to do it because they can't get the production going long enough. It's not worth it for them right. to take us on. So we'd have to pay extra to get that to happen. And then you're your workers are making double what they would typically make or more two or three times the textiles to use organic or regenerated fabrics that might cost anywhere from double to like five times just to buy the product before you ever sew it so it's it's tough to create a business in the fast fashion world where people are expecting you know you can go to kmart and get a four dollar t-shirt that isn't too bad you know right but you don't know what went into that and there's a lot to it i mean certain certain products being brought in from overseas if they're sprayed with uh what's that waterproofing it's like a chemical they put on like mm. everything says oh it's yeah it wicks the, away the moisture yeah, yeah anyways if you spray there, there was a long in the states specifically in california i think where if you import uh, uh something that's basically more healthy not sprayed with this chemical yeah that it's you don't get a tax break but you get like a t- 20 or 30 percent tax yeah. break on something that's been sprayed with the chemical that actually comes off when you wash the clothing yeah wow. so it's it's really strange there's been some strange uh lobbying happen in this part of the world but because i'd made most of my money from being sponsored by a clothing company i felt a huge interest in it obviously and some sort of a, a duty to go and learn this myself and try to make a, a brand out of it you know how involved in the process were you like when we look at your website are you well, I'm not curating the website and stuff at this point. Um, but it, I was I was it. very involved in the beginning. Yeah. Um, from design and all sorts of things. Not that I'm a designer. I can't I can't claim I designed that shirt. But you know, I, I have certain products I work on: um, sweats and surf trunks and cool. some tees and stuff. Where do you source uh, everything? What country? Uh, it's like seven different countries. Oh wow. We do our jeans, for instance, in Vietnam, and it's the it's the the cleanest uh, denim product basically in the world, denim factory. That's okay, cool. And uh, I think something like 98% of the dyes that are used are recycled. They don't just get dumped into a river. Like yeah. in China, you, there's a lot of rivers that are literally blue from being having all the denim uh, indigo dumped into the rivers. And uh, so we, we wanted to wait. We waited six or seven years before we did any denim because of that. So we're trying to do the right product and you know, make a, make a good enough brand out of it. Mm-hmm. So it people are super happy with the, with the product. So yeah, I stopped by the booth. I was at the Malibu chili fest. Like two oh, weeks yeah. ago. They I was going to go and I just was, I was just out of surgery and I was like, I don't feel like hobbling around on my crutches. Um, so now the company's uh, like grown to a point where you've, you've yeah, it's, it's grown every year since we started. So we're like nine years old now and, uh, it has increased. I mean, the first six years it doubled every year. Wow. And then even during COVID, we grew like 60% or something the first year. Nice, man. So, um, you know, we're happy we found our clientele and our customer. And um, and then <clears throat> as we grow, we'll be able to further bring prices down. Right. And maybe kind of bifurcate and, and create uh, a product that essentially starts cheaper so the, the end result is cheaper at retail. Mm-hmm. But I don't want to make cheap product. I, you know, I didn't set out to make $5 t-shirts. It's just, you know, buy fewer t-shirts that last longer and you, you like them. You like the way they feel and yeah. Yeah, dude. Um, okay. Let's talk about the, the, the ranch. Surf ranch. Yeah. Dude. Like, uh, <laughs> that was, that, that was the coolest experience for me ever. 
Like, Me too. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah. yeah. My first day there was like one of the best days of my life. And for sure. um, I mean, we see different uh, wave pools. I think we should tell people if they don't know that the Surf Ranch is an artificial wave designed by you. Mm -hmm. It's in um, like Northern California. Yeah, it's up near Fresno. And uh, it was a mystery at first. My business partner and I, who, who built it together, he was an ex um, water ski, pro water skier in the 80s. And he actually skied. These were two water ski lakes. And um, he had competed on these before, uh, back, back then in competitions. And then the one that we have on the, on the left there in the big picture, um, it was basically defunct, didn't have water in it. It was still graded out like a, a lake, but... But uh, it was empty, and um, right next to it on the left is a uh, that's a golf course called Falcon's Fire. We built, we bought that property too, so we have another hundred acres or more there. Um, and we acquired the lake next to us in in that time as well. And so on the other lake, we'd do e foiling and and um, you know wakeboarding and stuff. You know, just let the kids go stand a paddle or whatever. Yeah. So we kind of use that lake too, and and. Um, the technology. Yeah, man, it's, it's, it's it, it, the first moment I saw it was so baffling to me. I was in Fiji and my partner sent me a video and he said, we're just about ready. We need you back here on the weekend. And usually we go to Fiji, my favorite place in the world. We go Saturday to Saturday or so. And I, I left a day early. I was so excited. I'm like, I can't believe I'm flying back to California into the desert to, to leave Fiji to go surfing. Right. And, um, so the first day was December 5th, uh, 2015. And ironically, it was, a, it was a strange day for me because it was the same day that they ran the Jaws event, which I had been invited to. Uh -huh. It was one of the first ones. And so you got a Florida guy invited to surf that, but skips it to go surf a wave pool in the middle of the desert. <laughs> it was kind of a strange, it was a weird day for me. Um, one of the best days ever because I got to see this thing work for the first time, but at the same time... Um, it's not often that, uh, you know, us, us East coasters get a chance at big waves in the contest. So, yeah. uh, but yeah, had to pick this and watch that. The, uh, like the, the whole technology of the surf ranch, like the was, sled. it was, it was, it never been done, right? Like it was. Yeah. Done. So I'll, I'll give a, a brief rundown of the different technologies that exist. Um, when we launched, we were, we, we were nowhere close to the first wave pool ever, but we were the first great wave ever made in a wave pool. Yeah. Um, so we set out with a goal in like 2005 to make the, the, the main goal was to make a good swell and then you can break the swell by just forming a reef underneath. So I started on this, uh, kind of campaign to go find the right scientist or two that could help us. And one of my original partners was Bob McKnight, who was my boss at Quicksilver and he was a USC alumni. So he sent me over there to meet the professors that work on waves and you know, that could be light waves, sound waves, ocean waves. And uh, I sat down with these three guys. Two, two of the guys were sort of in there, about 80 years old, been there forever. And then there was one younger guy named Adam. And long story short, Adam uh, left USC and started working for us. And uh, he's the one who really came up with this idea. Everybody loves a good idea. And I think I might have one for you. How about if you stop making people have zero respect for you because of your filthy, embarrassing bad habit and trade in that bad habit for a good habit? That's what you do with Fume. This is a diffusive device which flavors air, and I happen to love it so much I don't go anywhere without it. It is always in my pocket. And you can get 10% off your journey pack if you go to tryfume.com and use the promo code STEVO. What's the journey pack? It's how you start your journey to a happier, healthier, less embarrassed you. Yep, by picking up that journey pack, you're on the fume team. You got that flavored air, which makes you feel good and it replaces the habit, dude. So go to tryfume.com. Use the promo code Stevo for 10% off your journey pack. And if you catch me in public, ask me if I've got my fume in my pocket. If I don't, I'll shoot you a little shout out video for all your dumb little buddies. 
Yep, that's right. One more time, go to trifume.com and use the promo code Stevo for 10% off your journey pack. Now let's get back to it. So we, we, send, <clears throat> we send a foil, our wave generator. It's like a foil that goes through the water. And it's, I guess, the easiest way to explain how it was designed is it was, uh, it's like the least efficient boat hull you could ever have. So instead of lifting up, it's pushing away. It's pushing uh -huh. water out. And uh, you can see it on the top left there, that blue foil there. Looks like a train. Mm. Everyone yeah. calls it the train. It's, it's a, it's a curve-shaped foil that goes through the water and sends off a swell sort of perpendicular to it. And for all the other wave pools out there, and you know, so many of them mm. have come up since the yeah. ranch, n none of them are doing it the way that, that they do it at the ranch. Is that right? It's just different. Yeah, it's a, total, it's, a, it's a different business model. It's a different technology. Um, because there's more energy, it takes the wave longer to... It takes all the, uh, the energy in the pool, the chop in the pool, to, to calm down a couple of minutes. Um, a lot of the other pools run a shorter weaker wave not as strong a wave by the way it's created but they can run a higher volume of waves and they can actually shape their waves um more on the fly than we can uh -huh. so ours is more like a point break like a long perfect mm -hmm. ride like i wanted to just, that's what my goal was to make a long perfect wave you get a barrel on and, yeah and um some of the other waves are designed specifically to do errors or just do turns for little kids or whatever so some of the other technologies are actually more um designable in, yeah. in the wave in the wave design They're probably cheaper too huh? um maybe i don't know the uh, economics of uh, upkeep and electricity but um ours for how big it is and how long it is the, the actual technology to impart the energy into the wave is the most efficient one out there um but it also is a super long like kind of ridiculously long wave you ride for like 45 seconds yeah for sure um and, it's and kind it's, of overkill like you, you only really need about a 20 second like 15 right. to 20 seconds i think is the is the sweet zone yeah because by that you're starting to get tired but um you know after a wave that's like eight to ten seconds which most of them are you're you're like oh, i just want a little bit more I just, like each time yeah and um so i i really think that sweet zone is going to be somewhere about half the length of our wave i think ours is, was it was overkill but we did it because that's how long the lake was and we're like oh let's just do it as long as that thing is and we didn't yeah. think oh well that multiplies your costs exponentially uh -huh. so um i'm surprised that we got to a place where we're in business because it costs so much to get this thing done to start with the uh the the surf ranch wave is the it, it's just weird that it's on like the the pro circuit for like the official mm. contest it's not now but it, oh, it has been yeah they they won't be on next year wow and uh why, why is that well um i think number one people find it to be too monotonous whereas in the ocean okay. when the, in the ocean you have that that uh the chance of luck you know yeah or that one great wave or something special can happen right at the end of that time period that didn't happen to the other person. Right. And so in that sense, you could argue that the, that luck or karma or something other played, the, played, played a role instead of just your surfing. My thought was when this came out that this shows everyone on the same wave, everyone has an absolutely equal chance. Yeah. Same number of rides, level playing same, field. same wave over and over. So it levels the playing field, but it, it's, it turns more into like, um, it becomes a little bit monotonous and predictable because you know, okay, you're gonna do three to, if you're really fast, maybe five turns before the barrel, then you're gonna get barreled for 12 seconds, then you're gonna come out and you're gonna figure out how to get from that barrel section to the last barrel section, and then time that just right, get a deep barrel and then do an air, or a tail throw or something, you know, yeah. some, kind of, some kind of maneuver at the end. And so people were just not seeing enough unpredictability in it right. to be big fans of it, but on the flip side, if you go there with your friends or like your family or something and just go for a surf, it's like the funnest day of your life. Big time. Funnest you, day of you, my you, life. You know <laughs> you're going to get good waves. That's the thing. Going on a surf trip, you're hoping you're going to get good waves, but then, oh, the tide's a little weird. It's super right. crowded. Uh, the wind's on short. Like, these things can all happen. At Surf Ranch, it doesn't really matter. Whichever way the wind's blowing, one way is going to be barreling. Right. Um, and you're always going to get a 45-second long ride or go the beginner wave that lasts, like, from very start to very beginning. It's like a minute and a half. Yeah. So... 
It just we can vary the wave a little bit, but it's it is relying upon the bottom shape. So in further designs, I'm working on ways to potentially, um, like say, let's say you run it at full speed, we have we could maybe make a reef that's a little bit deeper. When you run it at full speed, it breaks on that reef. If you run a little slower, it has a completely different reef inside. It's a little bit shallower, but it has a different wave shape. So there's, or you can make a wave break and then go into deep water and reform and break again near the shore and have like a smaller wave by the beach. But um, the, the, the other technology, just to get to those, like you have <coughs> surf lakes in Australia, which is like a big, kind of like a plunger, a big round disc that lifts up and drops down and it just sends a swell out in the 360. And then they build different reefs for that to break on. Um, wow. One of them, it's, it's, I, I think this aesthetically is a really cool design. Um, and one side of it, um, that nearest side on the bottom right is a, is like a full on barrel. Like it's a, it's a really, it's a short wave, but it's a, it's like a really deep spitting, shallow water, dangerous little barrel. Um, and then the other ones are just kind of turn waves and, and longboard waves. Um, yeah, and, the, uh, the surf ranch wave is the only wave that like you hope your friend doesn't catch the wave because yeah, you exactly. Get to go yeah. Next. Um, and then you have, um, like there's a wave in Waco. It's yeah. using American wave co technology. American wave co is out of San Diego and that's a pneumatic system. So like an air compression and, uh, it just kind of sends out jolts of, uh, you know, maybe two, sometimes one, but up to like five waves at a time. Yeah. And, uh, and then they'll calm it down for a minute because the currents start building. You've been to that one too? Yeah. Yeah, so, so you see the currents build up and they'll wait a minute. And because it's a smaller area, it calms down quicker than our pool. Uh-huh. Um, but I think that's a great design too. I think American Wave Co's made, they made a few waves. They have one in Brazil. Um, they have one in Japan. They're, I think they're kind of, in my opinion, they're sort of the leader. But then you have Wave Garden, which is actually a really sleek, kind of innovative design too. Aren't they supposed and, to build one in Oceanside here soon? I heard that, yeah. And then I don't know, Palm but, Desert. Yeah, um, <clears throat> and the Wave Garden one, you can see that like this, this is pretty cool. Like, you have a right and a left on either side, and um, then the current flows back out by that jetty in the middle, and that's run by some kind of a, a uh, what would you call it? Almost like an underwater bulldozer or something. Oh no, it's a sorry. This is a moving wall now. I think it rotates see how the waves are staggered on either side on the far right see on that right picture the top right of the screen yeah no the one that was there before yeah the this is the wave garden this is japan um yeah that one right there so click see how the waves are staggered they're not like meeting up in the middle yeah so this has almost like a snake wall that's like pushing away out one side and then comes back and push out the other side um I, that's how i understand the technology i surfed the one in melbourne it was really fun they gave me a the last two years i've been there they gave me a night with some friends for like two hours and took like 15 people in and half on one side and half on the other and just had a blast really it's a really cool like aesthetically pleasing like you stand in the middle at the bottom of the pool and you can see both waves being ridden at once or on that jetty in the middle and um they've done a good job with that are you in the works with another one um I'm constantly thinking about different... Oh, there's one more. In Palm Springs, there's one that just got built. That has got finished. Yeah, it's finished now. Um, my buddy Kalani Rob's working on that with Shane Magnuson. And Shane Magnuson's the one who worked for... He originally worked for American Wave Co. and went to Waco and designed all those ways for him. Yeah. But he got hired here, and they're working with a technology from a guy named Tom Lochtefeld, who used to do those, uh, you know, those standing waves, like the Schlitterbahn, and do you know those ones where they just send like water over a curved surface? The wave, wave in house San in San Diego. In San Diego. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, okay, and like Tony those. Hawk yeah, and those guys yeah, surfed yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's that's a little more like kind of like this this type of wave. So um, Tom Lockfeld developed this back in the late '80s, early '90s. I went to one in Texas in um, New Braunfels or somewhere back in '93. It was actually in Endless Summer too also mm-hmm. with Terry Hawkinson just me and him there for like three days of like funnest funnest weirdest trip ever at that time and um they've so Lochtefeld's developed this other technology that's kind of similar to what the American Wave Company is doing with the pneumatic system and um I don't exactly understand how this system works underwater but it basically compresses air out and pushes the swell and you have different little um, sections that kind of line up and you time them at the right time with the right amount of energy and you can make different wave shapes. So there's a few, you know, um, 
when, when when they started coming out with other waves, like ours sort of launched, and then a few other waves started happening, and it's a it's a funny feeling because you start feeling this competition from other people, and then somebody said to me, you know, like there's how many different plane makers in the world, you know? You have a right. Cessna, they're not competing with Boeing or Boeing and Airbus are doing the big things. You got fighter jets, you got all these different yeah. companies. I thought, yeah, the better, the more the better, because the more innovative. At some point, maybe there can be collabs between the two. You can hybridize different machines to create different wave shapes you won't have in nature. And um, it's pretty fun. It's Obviously, there's like, you hear some people argue, oh, it's not natur- natural. I would never ju- surf one of those. Yeah, there's kind of the Puritans that then, then there's over me it. and Tony Hawk. We're like, we never want to be in the ocean again. <laughs> and Tony's like, uh, I'm just going to live at Surf Ranch. <laughs> yeah, but, dude. Um, but you've already seen, like, big maneuvers, errors, and flips and stuff advanced crazy in the last few years since the wave pools have come out. Yeah, our Zeke. buddy Zeke. Yep. Zeke. Zeke's insane. Um, like, he, liter- like literally? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Zeke's classic. I um, see him all over the place. For sure. I mean, he's gotten better because of the wave pools. Yeah, and they're he's, like, he's oh, like yeah. the Waco he can just, he can, Im- Finger you know, flips. You, can, you can imagine an error and then go do it. Yeah. And that's kind of what he was doing in the wave pool when he went to Waco. Yeah, I uh, see. So you sold the ranch. Sold it, yeah. Kind of partnered with WSL. They sort of bought it from us, and then that's why they ended up making a surf contest from it because it was like something they owned, you know. Right. So, and I, it's and it's you can you can specifically say we're going to start the contest at this time, and every three and a half minutes there's going to be a ride or yeah. whatever. So it's it's a little easier for like if you were going to be on TV or something, you know. But it's um, I think it's as of now it's kind of run its course. For a competition. Yeah. And, and you have an open invite at all times? Yeah, I get a certain number of days a year being a, as a founder of the brand. And I'm st- I still here and there try to work on wave design and stuff. We can change and alter things here and there. But um, I wanna... we, we, we're working on other projects. Yeah. So we, we go up there and kind of imagine what else we could do with that. So I want to show you my photo from, from the ranch, my, my barrel photo. I got like we we have uh, traveled the world pretty extensively. Here we'll click through. I got that's Hawaii. an amazing shot at the ranch. I've never <laughs> seen that. <laughs> yeah, there's a uh, like I think I have like 15 different countries yeah. I got surf shots in. So you're just yeah. you're psyched on surfing, huh? Yeah, I, I I I do. That's probably my best shot from Costa Rica. Yeah, that's Playa Hermosa. So yeah. we'll just keep we'll, we'll blast through. Canada. Some of my good buddies live in Hermosa. Yeah, dude. Nicaragua. Ah, uh, Nicaragua. Maldives. Maldives. How fun is the Maldives, man? Yeah, so it's beautiful. A, yeah, super epic, man. Uh, um, yeah, we can we can blast through. I don't want to alienate do you know that, people. Do you know what's only... happened down in El Salvador? How they cleaned that country up? No. Yeah, they just really. They, yeah, they just basically like arrested all of MS13. Wow. Like, uh, like thirty-five thousand people and threw them in jail, and now it's like safe to go there and surf and shit. travel, and it's pretty wild what the president and his cabinet have done. But like. There we go. That's the ranch. Oh, there we go. There's my barrel shot. Who are you looking at? You're like looking over your shoulder. Like, I don't need to look back. <laughs> do I don't need to look forward. I'm going to look back at these guys on the ski. It's like Ramana's <laughs> yelling at you or something. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what'd you do? Broke something? It was within two weeks of uh, getting hardware put into my collarbone. Oh, no way. Yeah. That was two weeks after your surgery. I think I, I think uh, within two weeks, maybe less than three weeks, but uh, two weeks and change. Wow. So I think that's what it was, but but yeah. So I was just so stoked, man. That's my <laughs> my first barrel ever. And didn't I get it on like the last wave of the mm-hmm. session? Nice. Yeah, super rad, dude. I've got you to thank for it, man. I remember, <laughs> I remember hitting you up on Instagram to tell you how stoked yeah. I was. Classic. So uh, you're uh, all about the UFC too. Love UFC, man. Love it. Yeah, I've been a fan since the early days. I I, I guess in about. 2005 I really got into MMA watching and um, one of the, I was in Japan and I was out with some friends at a bar and I ran into Hoist Gracie and uh-huh. uh, I had known Hickson for a while and I don't know if that was the first time or not I'd met Hoist but he goes oh what are you doing here I said oh I had a contest and I'm flying back to California tomorrow and he, he goes no you have to stay my brother uh, Hoyler is fighting tomorrow at K1 or Pride yeah probably Pride and uh, I say yeah sure so I, I extended my ticket another day and um and went to the fight with with the family and i was sitting out in the crowd watching and he fought kid yamamoto 
and unfortunately kid caught him in the first couple minutes of fight and knocked him out for like he was out cold for a long time man like Ugh. i was like this guy might not wake up. he was out for like a couple minutes solid and i was just like freaked i was like i actually thought he got really hurt but um he was fine after but uh it was kind of cool because like kid yamamoto has passed away now but i met him a couple years later in vegas and um my girlfriend and I have this thing. Every time we meet one of the UFC fighters, I said, oh, can I get a picture of her punching you in the stomach? <laughs> so I had a picture of her punching Kid Yamamoto in the stomach. Like, <laughs> I don't think he felt it, but... So. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, dude, man. I, I got I, one with Chuck Liddell, too. Her hitting Chuck in, in Santa Barbara. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Chuck's the best, man. Um, do, you, do you ever tweet during the broadcast? I don't know that I've ever... Sometimes, I've, yeah. Yeah, <clears> here and there. I, I love the way they started putting tweets on the screen. Like, yeah, and, yeah, it's know. good because it's funny because you can see uh, when they when they tweet other fighters and especially if it's in their weight class. Yeah, you see a lot of bias in the way that they uh, yeah. throw a tweet out there. Yeah, for sure. Um, what, so is many, G, what is what is G twenty five GLE? I don't know. It just, um, oh, maybe twenty five years of Google or something. Yeah, happy birthday, Google. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Um, so many exciting fights coming up too, man. Like, I mean, just there, there always is. But mm. Yuri Prohaska and, and uh, Pereira, yeah. uh -huh. Pol and then um, Poloton. And we got uh, Patty Islam and Ferguson. And Oliveira. Pat, yeah, um, uh, Paula Costa Colby. and Kamzat. Yeah, uh -huh. I can't wait to see that Kamzat fight. It's, Colby it's, Covington and Leon Edwards. I'm really looking. I love watching Colby. Covington. Colby and Leon's going to be super interesting. You know, Col I mean, Colby's already playing that mind game and saying all this stuff about he's going to smash him and stuff. But I mean, I think Leon surprised the world with it. Usman beating him twice. Right. And soundly the second time. Right. It's a know? little bit like. Um, uh, where, where was um, Aljamain Sterling and Peter Yan? He had the belt. Dude, why did Peter Yan have to knee him in the face? He, he totally, had the fight. He was winning that fight. Yeah, it changed he totally his whole didn't life. Have to. But he, 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 you expect it on the rematch between Sterling and and uh, Peter Yan. Like, oh, the, no, now he's just gonna run through him. And and Sterling like. Mm -hmm. Dominantly, won. unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not, maybe not dominantly. Well, but, with the but, wrestling, he was. But yeah, there, it was not controversial. Not, yeah, not even, mm -hmm. not even close yeah. to controversial. Not yeah. even controversial. So. And then the O'Malley one was wild. I mean, he just caught him on the counter. It was like. Yeah. Oof, that was, that yeah. was. Uh, but you knew he, you knew that uh, Aljo was going to be r rushing in to try to get that takedown. Yeah. You know, and get his arms around him because on the ground, I think it'd be a different story. For sure. But that's the game, you know. Yeah. Um, the, uh, do you ever think like while you're watching fights, like, man, what's wrong with me that I love this so much? Like, <laughs> like, like, like it's you? funny. I was one of those kids in school. Like when anyone got in fights, I would break it up. Cause it just made me sick to watch people fight. Right. And, and, uh, UFC has actually helped me in my life. Uh -huh. Um, because every time I get hurt, like I broke my foot really bad, like six years ago, yeah. like terrible. And I went. Yeah, those guys get hurt like this all the time. Right. And and I was like, don't don't even stress about it. Like you'll be fine. Right. But when I was younger, I would have been like, that's the end of the world. My foot's d destroyed for. Uh -huh. If I actually, if I had done that to my foot when I was twenty, I probably would have ruined my career because they, I don't think they could have really fixed it back then. Like surgeries come so far to know how yeah, to wow. advance because it was my bones were literally like destroyed. Like how one. Many one bone was on like eight pieces, like little fragments. And the doctor said he was just like taking his tweezers and like putting them back together and trying to get it to sit back together again. But um, yeah, anyways, how many, how many these guys get hurt so much and it inspires me to go, oh, well, I'll be okay when I, get, when I get hurt. Yeah. How many surgeries have you had? Like just tons? Yeah, look at those bones. Those tons. Jesus. <laughs> what, what happened? Was it one incident? Um, yeah. Um, I... I was just, my leg was kind of straight. I was at Jeffrey's Bay and my leg was kind of straight. I was just practicing for my heat. And um, I was warming up on this board that I didn't really like. And uh, and I was thinking, I'll just come in and grab the one I like for one or two ways before I'm done mm -hmm. practicing. And I was just about to come in and <coughs> I pulled into this closeout tube and I was going to dive off in it. And instead I went, I'll just ride it out. And you can, there's two ways to deal with falling in a barrel. You can either dive and get under the wave and try to beat all that energy, or you stay on your board kind of as long as you can. And then the energy sort of 
absorbs into the the wave breaking so you don't get thrashed as bad so i just i was kind of in two minds like i'll either jump off or i'll ride it out and i couldn't figure out what to do and um my leg was kind of straight and i was thinking about jumping off but because my knee was totally straight my board must have flipped into me this way you know towards Mm -hmm. towards my um shin and um something had to just give i mean i wish my i wish in hindsight i wish my ankle would have broken in half because it would have been easier to to uh recover from but yeah all those little bones and they're so far from the heart and uh they don't readily fit back together it took about nine eight nine months for the bones to really actually heal back together and that just continued to haunt you i still every day my foot hurts yeah it sucks Uh. but i mean i'm i'm not complaining because i can run i can do whatever i want but like i like to play golf and it sounds kind of wussy but like if i walk nine holes i'm like in pain like my foot hurts really bad so i I pretty much only ride in a cart (coughs) um but uh no it's it's been um I, I, I would say I was lucky because most of my career I have not been injured. Prior to this foot, I had only ever missed one event at a time from any injury. I had never missed like half a year or something. Uh-huh. But this was from this injury plus a second surgery and then a, a, a an ensuing injury afterwards because of how bad my foot was injured originally and how, how much scar tissue there was. I, I did a different injury to it. Um, it. It was about a year and a half recovery really man so i was off tour kind of for well we had yeah i was off tour for like two years because of it so what uh i was just saying before before um we we met up with you today i was i was telling scott here that uh i I think a video of like just really doing an inventory of like the the destruction of my body mm-hmm. <laughs> you know like just the actual like what the the the, the all the, the cumulative damage and just kind of itemizing it the problem mm-hmm. for you is that you kind of choose it though you you right, right, you, I right, mean, right, you've, right. you've put yourself there like the, the interesting part is you're going to put yourself in a situation where you might get injured every time so right 10 percent of the time it's going to happen right <laughs> for, for sure and and i like my story for the longest time has been i'm in like re- like really surprisingly good shape you know given all that i've put mm. myself through and uh I'm, I'm feeling less inclined to say that now like uh now i've like just you know i'm the, the, the while you wake up in the morning up, your the back hurts you have a little arthritis up. here and there a little yeah. oh, i'm gonna sleep another hour it, yeah it's yeah. time it's it's time to make to to make that video i think that video is gonna yeah. be killer. <laughs> i had this uh, i uh, the surgery i just had was an elective surgery i didn't have to get it but the doc said you know there's a chance if you don't get it and you injure yourself more right now you might need a hip replacement instead of just a reconstruction um did you and, have hardware in there no, no hardware. I had hardware in the foot when I did it, but then I had it taken out in a second surgery. And now looking back, I wish I hadn't because it, it was such a hard recovery after the second surgery, like almost as hard as the original injury. Yeah, but as I understand it, if you break, uh, if you break something that has hardware in it, then it just fully shatters. Yeah, then you're screwed. That's yeah. what I was worried about. But those bones don't move a lot typically anyway right and i the the liz frank joint which is that the big joint right right here on the foot that one um i actually cracked that that second bone was cracked and then the fifth bone on the outside was cracked at the at the lower end of it this side yeah i guess the upper end of it um and so there was so much damage and because i put the picture online i was getting hit up from all sorts of different physios and doctors like oh did you just notice this oh this all you might want to check that and i'm like i don't i don't know if it was good to like open it up because now now i'm freaked out about how much injury right. i've done like my doctor didn't really diagnose the liz frank injury i had a break in the liz frank joint and uh, it wasn't obvious and um so we didn't really even talk about it but that a liz frank injury is like a year and a half when you do it but typically there's three ways that you can fracture it or the bones to your big toe and second toe can splay out or they can splay in and those ones are actually worse than cracking it. So I did the best of the three, like the most favorable recovery. But um, my, a friend of mine, Ross Williams, broke his. He displaced them outward, just doing like a one foot air off the back of a wave. And his foot just hit wrong and it just like exploded his foot. And he didn't surf for a year and a half. Yeah, like like physique tore his ACL. It didn't look like anything. Yeah. Like, I don't, uh, oh, yeah, right. 
Yeah, the, the other day. Yeah, I don't know if we. I don't know if Ross had any pictures online from his. His was like twenty years ago. I feel like everybody in like the surfing community has this urban legend. I was talking about it with Isaac yesterday that they all know somebody or they have all heard the story of a friend that you know wiped out and the fin cut their testicle and their testicles unraveled. Have you do you know anybody that this has happened to? Have you ever heard this story? <laughs> is this? Oh, wait, what does a testicle do when it unravels? You mean it comes out of like it like it slices their testicle open yeah, 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 and it yeah, unravels? Yeah. And it just like comes out or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Isaac, yeah. will you say you've heard this? Yeah, yeah, I've heard this. And then you've asked somebody else and they've heard it and I'm like, dude, I've heard that. What too does it before. mean when I, a testicle unravels? What does that mean? I guess there's like all these little like intestines it looks like in there and it just unravels. Huh? Yeah, a testicle. I suppose is it like, like a ball of thread. Somehow. Yeah, is it like a is it like an old golf ball with a bunch of brand band aids, so. a, a rubber bands around it? Or? You'd be the person to ask. <laughs> I, that's that's what I would think. No, I, I've, uh, <laughs> you've never known anybody for this to happen, or like, what's the worst surf Tom, injury you've Tom ever seen? Tom Carroll talked about an injury he had. Um, he was in Japan, and, and his this is in, this in the eighties, early eighties, and and his board. He had a single fin board, I believe, at the time, and he wiped out, and it, it went under and came back and literally shot him in the butt and, like, ripped his whole butt and anus and everything, like, cut it all open. Oh, really? And he had to go to the... Obviously, I had to go to the hospital like, to get surgery, and um, he told me they put him on this, like, cold steel hygienic table, and he was laying on his stomach, and... He had like a, three or four nurses and a doctor or two all around, like literally having to pull up in like his butt cheeks Holy and talk. Oh and and he said he's freezing and he's wet. <laughs> and like, and, and, and he said he was so embarrassed, but he couldn't understand what anyone was saying because it's in Japan. So he's like, he's like, I just remembered like looking and they were all just like looking down at my anus, like trying to figure out how are they going to fix me and Holy how disgusting fuck. the whole thing was. Jeez. Yeah. But, um, I've heard, I've heard of a couple people getting speared in their butt by the board and it doesn't sound like something I ever want to go through. But yeah, it, also it's a lot of people get turned off from surfing because they get hit in the head by the board the first time they surf sure. or whatever. Or break. Somebody told me I met a, met a guy yesterday. We were talking about some work stuff, and he said I've only ever tried to surf once, but he's like I didn't do it again because my board hit me in the nose and broke my nose. And I was just bleeding everywhere, and he goes, that was my first time ever trying to surf. I broke <laughs> yeah. a tooth with the, my board. Yeah. Right in the beginning. Yeah, smash it. It, didn't, it is embarrassing. It hap that happened at the Waco pool. Really? <laughs> 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 yeah, like the, the place with no variability. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's that. We've we've had some gruesome injuries, you know. That was like one of my friends, um, Shay Lopez, he's from Florida. He was surfing at the pipeline contest, and it, this one particular year, it was only rights because the swell direction, you can only go right, and that's on his backhand. And the sandbar had formed on the reef, so it made the reef extra shallow, and then off the reef, it would just drop off into deep water. And, you know, you've probably seen those waves at Chopu that kind of go down before they go up. You know, the, if, if a wave is Which sucking off, in, yeah, if yeah. it's sucking off a shallow enough bottom compared to the height of the wave, the wave will actually go below sea level first. It'll go down like a wave in a river on a rock. Mm -hmm. You know, it dips down like a rapids. So really super shallow, intense waves will do that. And Shay was doing a floater on maybe like a six or eight foot high face and free fell off it. And when he hit the bottom, his leg was completely straight and he landed straight into that. Um, mm -hmm. part that was the dropping dip, yeah. the dip that was going like below sea level and nothing gave you just saw his knee go backwards and sideways Ugh. and like inward and and then he just like it looked like he got completely mangled like in a in like a car compactor or something he hit the water and and the the footage was amazing whoever filmed it they kept filming him after he came up because they knew he got hurt and he's just laying with his head down on the board with his arm waving like this for for uh, the safety crew to come get him and you could just tell like this guy just ruined his leg like maybe for life and he didn't surf for two years i think like at, he said he blew everything completely tore acl mcl pcl and um it was just like a, a minefield in his, in his like, a, like a, a mine went off in his in his kneecap uh, yeah, his knee. in some of these countries where you like go to the, the hospital and it's like not the best surgeons you're like, yeah oh, i mean fuck. if you did that and i mean like when i broke my foot i was in africa i'm like i'm getting on a flight and going back to the states a couple of my friends said, oh, there's a good surgeon or two in Cape Town, but I called my surgeon back, surgeon buddy back here, and he goes, look, I, he's like, I could do it, and I'd be all right. Like, I'm pretty good with feet, but I'm going to find the best guy I can, like, in the States yeah. for you. And it turned out that 
the guy he got me was a guy named Tom Harris, who's a doctor up in Burbank, and he actually surfs, and he went to school with a couple of my buddies in Ventura, and uh, just by chance, he ends up being the best guy at this, him and it, uh, another doctor named Max that worked together on my foot, and, um, and uh, yeah, they put me back together, so. Do you have a scar? Yeah, right there. A couple. <coughs> in there. They just basically f opened those, like, with forceps or something and worked there for a couple hours. You weren't awake for that, were you? No, no. Well, I yeah, just took an aspirin. I was good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, my, the crazy thing is um, my foot swelled up, like, where I couldn't even get my toes into a sandal, you know? Like, my foot was twice the size for, like, a month. I had the, what they call pitting edema. You ever had that? Where, like, the tissue just swells. It's almost like it died and it's full of fluid. Like you have all this inflammation, so it's almost like nature's um, uh, cast. You know, it just locks your foot. Is that it on the right, right there. That was that was right when it happened. That was that was before my surgeries and before it was all big. But um, yeah, it was <clears throat> it was it was huge. I could push my thumb. I could like take my finger and push like this, and it would leave like a little teacup, like a wow. an indentation uh, in my foot. Do you ever mess with ice baths for yeah. recovery? Yeah. Yep. You a big fan I love, of those? I love the ice baths. I'm, I'm not doing them as much as I should. Last winter I was doing them a lot, like pretty much daily. Um, and you found that it helps with arthritis? It just helps with inflammation and recovery. Yeah. And um, sleep patterns too. Like, But the best thing to do is basically get up in the morning and jump in cold water or cold shower. Yeah. And it's just kind of, it's like they say it's a stressor on your body, but a positive one. So it just lets out certain endorphins and mm -hmm. that helps your body learn how to heat itself up better. You want to heat up naturally and then do like a couple hours of sauna a week, you know? Yeah. It's like you're taking the cells and you're shrinking them down with the ice and you're, you're expanding them with the heat. So you're getting all this flushing and inflammation in your, in your body. Do you have a setup at your, at your place? I don't here. Um, we haven't really spent much time here in California <coughs> the last couple of years, so mm -hmm. I haven't set myself up here, but I got a setup in Florida and I got a setup in Hawaii. Yeah. And, um, in Australia, there's a place right by my house where I go do it. So... So what's uh, like what what's in the future for like are you gonna keep competing? Was it's it? not gonna be long now. I'm I don't think I'll get in the Olympics, but if there's a chance to get in the Olympics, that would probably be my like sort of swan song event um, for full time competition. But, wow, dude, so, how cool would that be? So we'll see. I didn't I didn't qualify for it, so we'll see what happens there. If, if there's any other way to kind of get a wild card or if somebody gets injured or something. But as of now, I'm not qualified for it. So have uh, it at the surf ranch. Yeah. I mean, the, the Olympics is kind of the perfect event to have at an artificial wave. Big time. Yeah. Because it's, you just have that standard over and over and it's more obvious for people who don't know surfing to watch it. It's like watching that river raft, like the river kayaking, mm -hmm. the slalom course they do. They have the exact same flow for every person. They build a course with yeah. the exact water flow. So, yeah. so it really comes down to the skill level where I think the Olympics potentially is a good uh, format. It, it would be a good format to run in a wave pool because of that consistency. But so far, I mean, the next one's going to be at Chopu. And we're all hoping it's like giant, terrifying. And, and uh, the thing is that because it's France, they could have Chopu because it's Tahit Tahitian, uh, Tahiti is French territory. So it's going to be the only event on live in the middle of the night for France. So surfing will kind of be displayed on its own in some fashion because there will be no other live events at that time. That'd be cool. But they, they have, I, I think they have a three day window and they got, they, they need two days to run. Yeah. So we don't really have much of a waiting period. And the problem is Tahiti can get these Maramu winds. They can have really small shitty swell. So if they would give us that whole two week window of the Olympics, maybe even 10 days, like somewhere in the middle, we'd for sure get good waves. But as of now, there's the average day at Chopu is not a great day. Right. You know, it's like, right. it might be fun. It could be tiny. It could be onshore. It could be the wrong swell, you know, it could be too south or what. There's a lot of different variables that go into people. People take it for granted. You see pictures or videos of Chopu and you go, oh my God, that place is right. almost terrifying. You go there on an average day, it might be head high, <clears throat> might not be swell. The wind's, wind's wrong or something. I mean, typically the wind's pretty good. But yeah. they, you can get these Maramu winds for like a month that are onshore and not good. Basically the same thing at Cloud Nine, right? It's not always. Yeah, yeah. Because we we went there and and it was it, it wasn't. Yeah, I haven't surfed Cloud Nine, but I've huh. never been. But I know it's a fun wave. But it surfing got real popular be, when they found Cloud Nine, 
25 years ago or whatever. Right. And they publicized it. Boom. Just all of a sudden it created a huge sort of surf community right there. Uh, that, that seems shocking to me that you yeah. haven't surfed Cloud9. I know. I just haven't been to Phil. I want to go to the Philippines. I think there's a lot of undiscovered surf in the Philippines. I'm yeah. sure of it. There has to be. Yeah. I'm sure yeah, of it. Um, for sure. Yeah, so, a lot of good waves there. So, yeah, so fingers crossed for the Olympics. And uh, other than that, I mean, they would, we're at that point. Like, what do you picture being, like, 60 and 70? Like, do you have, like, a, an idea of, like, what that looks like? Um, I'm just going to be surfing a lot still. <laughs> I'm just going to, you know, I want to be super fit. I've been talking about this since I was in my 20s, you know. I want to look 10, 20, 30 years out and be be fit enough. I don't want somebody taking care of me when I'm old. Right. I don't want to be that person laying in a bed like, give me a drink, you know. Right, right, Just right. I want to be healthy. And I think with all the information we have through social media and, and, and anything on the web and all the studies that are being done now for health, everyone has the access to that knowledge and right. to, to create much more longevity in their lives, you know. I mean, I, I fight with friends about it because I have too many friends who are overweight not taking care of themselves, not eating a good diet, too much sugar, too many right. carbs, um, drinking too much. And, um, you know, that stuff just takes a toll. It's why would you not want to have your physical health as good as it could possibly be? It's, a, it's my priority. So right. I, I want to, I, my goal, here's my goal. My goal is at 90 years old to get barreled at back door <laughs> nice. and I'm taking any fucking wave I want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out there at 90. That's sick, dude. <laughs> Yeah, dude. If I can pull it out, if I get paddled out there at 90, I'm like, I'm going on every wave I want. <laughs> dude, I love it, man. Man, I, I, I got to say that, like, just for how completely rad you are, like, I've, I've, I've maintained my stuff, you know, like, it's just, impre like, you're an impressive dude, man. Oh, man and, like, I, I see footage of you, like, you know, I just see footage of you doing your thing, like, just the, the goat here, man. And, uh, and uh, right. you know, to just like, just to keep it cool. And for, dude, what an honor, man. What, I really appreciate you doing Thanks this. Thanks a lot. Us. Yeah. I mean, I've obviously watched you for a long time. Um, <laughs> you know, my, my manager, do you know my manager, Terry? He, Terry. he managed uh, BAM forever. Oh, uh, okay. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, no, but, uh, but yeah, I've been kind of around the peripheral of your guys' jackass stuff for a long time. Obviously, the early days. I was living up in L.A., and I was kind of buddies with Spike Jones back in the uh, okay, day. Okay, cool, man. So I was kind of, I was living in Silver Lake for a while, for a few years, so I was kind of uh, in and around that scene a little bit. Spike loves surfing. Yeah. He, he yeah. kills it at the ranch. Yeah, I actually haven't, I, I haven't seen him surf up there. I saw him up there once, but... I, I saw, I saw... You saw what, Spike surf at the ranch? I think that when we left there, at one point, I went there, and Spike was coming in with Jonah Hill. Oh, really? Like, uh, like right yeah, Jonah after. goes a lot. Jonah's, like, crazy about it. Yeah. Yeah. For sure, but yeah, dude, this is Spike, Spike kind of kind of ripped on the ranch. <laughs> I, saw, I saw a clip. Classic. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. But it's rad, man, and... um. We, we of course uh, are, are are pushing outer known. Um, congrats on that. And yeah, and thanks, what, man. What other stuff uh, like um, and, and anything? Your social media? It's just Kelly Slater. Yeah, it's just Kelly Slater. Yeah, I'm actually not even that active on it anymore. I just, I, uh, I, did, I'm, I, 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 I like never. I probably posted six times last year, and twice were like a couple weeks ago. Right. I just, I got kind of tired of everyone's opinion, I guess. But it's, I do, I do like the debates. They come up online, but um, I just, I think I feel less and less inclined to share my life. That's probably healthy. Yeah, I, but uh, yeah, I mean, think I'm addicted to Instagram like anyone else. You know, I look at it all day long and stuff, but I yeah. just don't post much. Right. But I, I feel like I should, like, um, I don't know. I like, I like, I do like posting things that are important to me. Like, um, we just had two world champs crowned last week. Um, a couple of days before that, my good friend Jimmy Buffett passed away. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have endless stories of, of uh, Jimmy. He's just, he's an absolute legend in my life. I grew up on his music and being a Florida boy. Yeah. He captured what Florida is. Big time. The, the, the lifestyle of Florida, if you fish and dive and sail. Jimmy, like, I know a lot of people who aren't fans of music maybe thought some of the lines are goofy, like Cheeseburger in Paradise or whatever. But if you listen to some of the poetry that he wrote in his music... He wrote a song called He Went to Paris that's like just a tearjerker. And after he passed away, I was just thinking about different lyrics that he had said. And it was almost like he was prophetic in um, 
just describing like what his life meant to him in real time. And you read his letter, you read his message after he's he's gone, and he explained it so well through through word and music. And um, you know, the, the end of that song says some of it's magic, some of it's tr- tragic, but he had a good life all the way. And that kind of sums up uh, Jimmy to me. You know, it was tragic in the end because he he got cancer and died pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, it kind of went a little bit fast on him, but um, he I don't know of another person who uh, is in that sort of uh, realm that he is of fame and making money and all that stuff who enjoyed his life as much as Jimmy. Like, he flew his own planes, he had boats, he had houses everywhere, and he loved to invite people to come stay and share and do stuff with him and tell you about the waves he was surfing or place he was fishing or whatever. Yeah. And uh, he's just a, he, he, he was a big influence on my family, and uh, it was a real pleasure to know him. I love that man. I love that, and uh, I, 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 I'll, give, I'll give you a, a legendary Jimmy Buffett story. All okay. right. So my brother is like, he's a, he's a parrot head. He's like, I mean, we all grew up on Jimmy's music, but my brother like nonstop. My brother says if it wasn't for Jimmy's music, I don't know if I'd still be here. Like okay. it was so influential on him, and um, uh, so my brother was getting married about ten, twelve years ago, and. Uh, I was talking to Jimmy. I was hanging around him quite a bit back then, and he said, uh, "He's like, oh man, what are you up to?" And I said, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna get my way down to uh, Key West in the next couple of days. My brother's having his bachelor party." And he goes, "Well, you know, I'm in Palm Beach, and I was thinking about flying down there. So why don't you just come, just get a ride down here, and I'll, I'll take you." So he flies me down to Key West, and uh, we land. And he goes, "All right, you all set?" And I'm like, "I'm gonna go meet my brother and all them." He goes, "All right, call me when the party's on. I'll catch you guys later." He's like, "I gotta catch up with some friends and my sister." So he went and did his thing for a few hours, and then we got all our friends got to this bachelor party, and I walk in with Jimmy Buffett in Key West, and my brother was like, "Dude, what the fuck's going on?" <laughs> he's like, "What?" He's like, "What the fuck?" He's like, he's just like, what? He's looking at Jimmy like you saw a ghost, and he's looking at me going, "What? What just happened?" He's like almost crying, almost laughing, and he's just like, "What?" He just couldn't process it because like Jimmy's just been such an influence, and you know, at 50 years old, he's getting married, and or 45, and and Jimmy's there to celebrate you know it was such a cool moment in in my life that's great that's yeah. being in key west it's like so jimmy you know Big time. <laughs> like, yeah yeah but, yeah florida's yeah, rad a, dude he was a good dude um we're fucking right on man um but you know even if you're not posting dude where everyone get over there and follow kelly slater man i can't tell you how many guests i've had on the podcast where like i, I don't know and i never even thought to follow him but like oh, yeah. i thought like and i love that you and i have followed each other for like a pretty good long time yeah then, man I, like, I will say like the, the the epic thing about instagram social media is just the access to meeting people around the world you know yeah. like like you said i'm a huge ufc fan and you know, through that, I've met a lot of the fighters and stuff. And I'm, I'm just a fan, you know. But like, right. it's uh, like, um, I don't know, it's been fun to have that exposure. And I met Dana about 12 years ago and started going to fights and stuff. And yeah. And over the years, got to meet a lot of the fighters. Became really close with a few buddies. They've, you know, just always kind of include me in there. Like Cheeto Vera is a really good friend of mine. Yeah, he surfs. And, uh, yeah, and Cheeto's been to surf ranch a couple of times. Vitor Belfort. Um, some of the old school guys like Ricardo Arona and Hickson. And the, yeah. it's been really just a fun thing for me because I'm, I love to watch them train and, uh, pick their brains about, you know, their mindset and stuff. Yeah. So How about Max Holloway? Yeah. Friends with Max uh, somewhat, you know, I don't, I don't, yeah, we don't hang out, but we ranch? work. He, I don't know if he's been up there. I invited him up. Um, you know, his wife surfed there. Yeah. Um, she was on tour for a while. She's a really good surfer. And, uh, after his last fight, I was messaging with him and I was like, Hey, be my guest anytime you guys are free dude, come over love it, man. i, I want to see max at surf ranch mm-hmm. dude, um, man, max is the best well right on man dude we'll, we'll, we'll let you go i just want to thank you again man but really really cool to get thanks to talk for coming to down dude love yeah of it. course cool yeah cool, man. Cool. do you always do them in in the van pretty much yeah yeah pretty much like there's sometimes when we're on tour we're on the bus Sometimes, uh, like we're just you know without a vehicle and would rent a studio or something. Hmm. But yeah, most of them. You know, we've had a lot of rad people sit in this man, dude. That's cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot of a uh, lot of rad people. Yeah, and, yeah, I've and, seen a few. But yeah, cool. Do you have a home studio too? 
No, we no. always like, uh, as a rule, man, we want to bring the studio to the guest. Cool. There have been times when people will just come to my house and then we get in the van in front of the house. Yeah. But yeah, easy. Well, right cool. on, brother. Thank you so much. Thanks, bud. Dude. Yeah, it's a pleasure yeah. meeting you. Yeah, guys. For sure. Meet you guys. Got to get you up to Surf Ranch again. Dude, I would love that. Yeah. I, I would love that. My, my knee's been giving me some grief in my hip. Yep. How about that? I, uh, I was seriously starstruck. I mean, this guy's so rad, dude. And what else can I say? You are so rad. I just can't thank you enough. I mean, I say it every week, and I mean it every time. You guys who stick around to the very end of the Wild Ride podcast, you mean the world to me. And what else can I say? Um, candidly, it's... Uh, it's ambitious to get my bucket list special out by November 14th, but hear me now. Come hell or high water, we're going to pull it off. And God damn, is it so good. It is so unbelievably filthy and good. And I can't wait for you to see it. I love you, and thank you for sticking around. <clears throat>